Chapter 5, Z-Scores, Location of Scores in Standardized Distributions, Part 1. In this chapter, our learning outcomes or objectives are as follows. And we'll understand Z-score as location in a distribution. We'll learn to transform X, an X value into a Z-score. Again, an X value is just a placeholder for the variable that we're interested in studying. For example, SAT score, or height, or weight and we'll be able to transform any x value in a distribution into a z-score, which is considered a standard score. We'll learn how to transform z-scores back into x values. We'll describe effects of standardizing a distribution, and we'll learn how to transform scores into a standardized distribution. And a standardized distribution is one that has a predetermined mean and standard deviation. Tools you will need. So this um, chapter requires that we have mastered the concept of the mean, um, one of the measures of central tendency, and we know that we have two different equations, whether we're using a population, which is the sum of x over population size, or for a sample, m is equal to the sum of x over n. We'll also need to have mastered this concept of standard deviation. By definition, standard deviation refers to the average or standard difference between scores in a distribution and the mean of the distribution. The standard deviation um, will reveal how consistent scores are in a distribution or how inconsistent the scores are. So briefly, if we have a distribution that looks like this, um, then we would say this, the scores are very consistent and similar to the mean versus something that looks like this, where we have a higher standard deviation. So here, our standard deviation would be lower in comparison to here, standard deviation would be higher. So before we can move on into understanding z-scores, we must ha have a basic understanding of what standard deviation reveals to us, um, the information it conveys, and also know how to to compute standard deviation. So we have our equations for populations and we've learned how they differ from the equations for our sample and we learned um, the computational and um, definitional formulas to calculate our um, variance and standard deviation, in particular the sum of squared deviations. And just briefly, if we just consider the definitional process whether we're using a population or a sample, we can review that SS for population is the sum of our mean deviations squared. And then our variance is equal to, a variance is the average of squared um, mean, deviations, um, mean deviations. So we recognize that our equation is SS over our population size and our standard deviation is the square root of our variance. For the sample SS, using the definitional um, equation, the equation is sum of our deviations squared. Variance is the average of those squared deviations. And the difference, as we learned in the last chapter, we take SS divided by n minus 1, so we produce an unbiased statistic. And then our standard deviation is simply the square root of our variance. So that's just a quick review of the um, equations we learned in the last chapter. Again, this is the definitional process of computing SS, which leads us to variance, which then allows us to calculate the standard deviation. Again, by definition, standard deviation is the average difference between scores in a distribution and the mean of the distribution. And it, it reveals the consistency or inconsistency of scores. Finally, you should... Um, Refresh basic algebra skills. Um, if need be, review the math review in Appendix A that we, we um, completed back in week one because we will be using equations and um, solving for different variables. We'll need to manipulate the, the values in the equations to isolate and solve for different values. Um, so make sure that you have a, a strong foundation in basic algebra so that we can proceed. So again, as I indicated um, before, if you understand the purpose of the statistic you're calculating, you will better understand the computation or the equation that goes along with that statistic and understand its application. 
So the purpose of z-scores, the primary purpose is to identify and describe a location of every score and distribution. So some of the scores and distribution may equal the mean. Most likely, um, most won't. So we want to understand where these scores, these x values, reside in relation to the mean. Keeping in mind that the mean is one statistic that represents all. So again, it's a summary of all of the values. And we want to understand if we take one x values, we want to understand where it's located. Is it above that value the me of the mean? Is it below? How far is it from the, that particular summary statistic which we refer to as the mean? Um, we'll also standardize an entire distribution by creating z-scores. So z-scores, the purpose is to standardize an entire distribution. We're moving into inferential statistics. By definition, inferential statistic refers to the process of collecting data from a sample to draw conclusions about a population. Now, when we're comparing different groups, um, different conditions of the independent variable, for example, those who get the drug, those who don't get the drug, we recognize that the um, makeup or characteristics of each of these distributions are going to be different and essentially we'll be comparing apples to oranges. But we really want to find out if the drug was effective. So we have to um, find a way of standardizing these distributions so we can make fair comparisons. It's kind of um, the analogy that can be used is when you find the common denominator to work with fractions. So z-scores serve that purpose of um, standardizing distribution so they can be equitably compared. Um, when we have two different groups, we can't expect the sample sizes to be equal, the means aren't going to be equal, the standard deviations aren't going to be equal, and we want to compare them, um, again, to determine if our hypothesis is correct. The drug, we hypothesize the drug will be effective. We administer the drug to one group, not to the other. For us to make these comparisons, we have to compare things that are equitable, and z-scores will allow us to do that. The final purpose is to take different distributions and make them equivalent and comparable. So I just went over that. So again, you can think of it as taking apples um, and comparing it to oranges, recognizing that that's not um, equivalent or comparable or equitable but taking those distributions and created a third distribution and let's say now we can create a distribution of pairs so taking apples and oranges and converting them all to pairs and now if they're all pairs we can compare what if one pair is larger than the other extremely larger very similar um, so all of those comparisons can be made um, equitably and um, evenly in terms of comparing similar things. So here's a nice visual of what I'm talking about. In, in distribution A, we have a mean that's denoted in the center there equal to 70 and a standard deviation equal to 3. In our second distribution, distribution B, we have the same mean of 70 but the standard deviation is equal to 12. Just by comparing the standard deviations, we would conclude that distribution A is more consistent. In other words, the scores in distribution A are more similar to the mean in comparison to distribution B. The, the scores in distribution B are more spread out. Um, the visual doesn't really demonstrate that effectively, but simply by um, understanding the standard deviation is equal to 12 points, we understand that the scores in this distribution are less similar to the mean when compared to distribution A. Now let's consider a score of 76. Where would that reside in distribution A? So we see that one standard deviation unit places us at a score of 73. So we would understand that um, if we want to move to a score of 76, that's the score of interest, we'd have to go up another standard deviation unit. So technically, a score of 76 is equal to two standard deviation units above the mean. Now, and, and that would be considered a more um, extreme score than a score of 73. Again, we've learned that approximately 70% of scores occur within one standard deviation unit 
below and one standard deviation unit above. And so anything outside of that, again, if we understand frequency, right, that's the highest peak in the center, anything beyond that um, seems less likely or more rare or extreme. Now in the second distribution, our standard deviation is equal to 12 points. If we go out one standard deviation unit, that puts us in x value of 82. And again, the score of interest was 76. So now we see that um, the score of 76 falls within this common region, this, um, again, the area above one standard deviation unit. And if we considered um, one standard deviation unit below, so this is positive one. So again, this shaded area represents the common area of a distribution. And because this distribution is more spread out, a score of 76, is within one standard deviation unit. So again, we have two distributions with the same mean, but the variability of each is very different. And therefore, a score of 76 is going to fall in a different location for both distributions. So we're going to use these scores to better understand how far a score is from the mean of a, of a Z distribution so that we, when we have instances of two different distributions, we can create a third distribution that allows us to make fair comparisons. And before I move on, if we just think about this score of 76, it's six points above the, uh, the mean of 70. So technically, we would say that um, the score of 76 is half a standard deviation unit above the mean. because one standard deviation is equal to 12. We move up six, right? So six is half of 12, so it's 0.5 standard deviation units. Again, illustrating this more common score in that distribution, because that distribution has greater variability in comparison to the first distribution. So in more detail, z-score and location and distribution. It, um, the z-score is going to tell us um, the exact location um, and it's going to be expressed as um, using a sign and a numeric value. So the sign, it's either going to be positive or negative, tells us whether a score is located above or below the mean. So again, if we have a normal distribution with the mean in the center, um, typically we have one, two, three standard deviation units above and three standard deviation units below, and that captures, if we go out three standard deviation units above and below, that captures approximately 99% of all the scores in distribution, and we recognize there, there may be some other extreme scores um, occurring outside of that, but if we just focus on three standard deviation units above and below, we capture the majority of the scores or occurrences in any normal distribution. So again, the sign is simply going to tell us that we're talking about, if it's positive, we're talking about a score above the mean, and negative z-score indicates that we're talking about a score that's below the mean. And the numeric value, the numeric value tells us how far that score is from the mean expressed in standard deviation units. So again, you can think of the definition of a z-score as identifying the exact location of an x value in relation to the mean of the distribution expressed in standard deviation units. So again, the z-score tells us where this x value resides. Um, is it above, below? And then it tells us exactly how many standard deviation units that score is from the mean. So again, as I indicated and we've um, read in, pre in a previous chapter, that 70% of scores are going to fall one standard deviation unit above and below. And again, that should make sense because of this idea of frequency, right? This is the highest peak here in the center. So we have the majority of scores centered around the mean of the distribution. Most scores are going to fall within one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. And we can see that the occurrence of values outside of that common region start to decrease. So we see this decrease here and here, right, in frequency. And we recognize that um, this 
if it, we're talking about a population, this really never touches the abscissa because we have those extreme cases that maybe we have an, an X value that produces a z-score of 0.5. That would be a very extreme and unlikely score, but it is possible. So again, we can convert all distributions into this z-distribution. And we'll learn, um, and I'll repeat in just a moment, that a z-distribution, the mean becomes 0, and the standard deviation is equal to 1. And we'll talk more about that as we move forward. So here's a quick learning check um, to affirm that we understand this first section of chapter 5. So a z-score of z equal to positive 1.00 indicates a position in a distribution. And we consider a above the mean by one point, b above the mean by distance equal to one standard deviation, c below the mean by one point, d below the mean by distance equal to one standard deviation. So we can omit these because we know it's positive, right? We said that anything that's positive is above, above the mean. Now let's consider a and b. What's the difference? Um, a simply just says above the mean by one point, and that's inaccurate because these scores are expressed in standard deviation units. That's what we are conveying. How far is this score in standard deviation units? Um, I'm going to take you back to one of the visuals um, to kind of hammer this home. So again, here we, with the first distribution, distribution A says standard deviation is equal to 3. So a score of 73 is one standard deviation unit, right? 70 plus one standard deviation of three points is equal to a score of 73. So that's one standard deviation unit. A score of 76 is two standard deviation units, right? So 70 plus two times three would be six, so that's 76. So we recognize that a score of 76 is two standard deviation units above the mean. So again, we're not just expressing location in terms of points, but we're saying how many standard deviation units. So in this case, one standard deviation unit is equal to three points. Next, true or false, um, a negative z-score always indicates a location below the mean. So yes, we, we clearly indicated that the sign is telling us above or below. Negative is in relation to below the mean, so this would be true. And the next one, a score close to the mean has a z-score close to 1. So let's draw this out. Again, if we standardize the distribution into z-score, as I said, the mean is equal to 0 and the standard deviation is equal to 1. So this in the center would become 0. And of course, we move up positive um, standard deviations this way and negative standard deviation units this way. So it says a, a score close to the mean has a z-score close to 1. Well, that would be false because if it's close to the mean, it would be close to the score of 0, a z-score equal to 0. And finally, here's a slide to affirm those answers. So the first one, the sign indicates the score is below the mean. A positive z-score would indicate above the mean. So again, the z-score has two components, the sign, positive or negative, and it indicates which side of the mean it is on. And then um, the second one says a score quite close to the mean would have a z-score close to zero because now the mean of a, a z-distribution is equal to zero. And that concludes part one of chapter five. In the next part, I will go over the equation of how to calculate a z-score.